So as promised, we start today a series that will take us all of April entitled uh, Mission Control. Uh, we as a church family uh, are going to put our full attention on what we say our mission is, and then we are going to evaluate it together and work together on how we can do it better, maybe what's falling through the cracks and we're not doing well. Um, that's what we're going to spend April doing. Uh, the trick in a series like this is, um, of course, it serves a very important function for us, for us as a community of faith, but we also want to do these messages or these Sundays in a way that it's beneficial to your own spiritual life, your own relationship with God, so that there's individual application to, and hopefully I can do that uh, decently well. I'm sure... Uh, the chairs, are, if you're a guest today, no, this is not normally how the chairs are. So let me just go ahead and do what Cheryl Rhodes thought was very funny every time somebody walked in today. I apologize to you that I made you change where you're sitting normally. And I understand for some of you that's really hard. I get it. You'll survive. Don't hyperventilate. Um, there's a reason, of course, to why the chairs are like this. And that's because when you turn, and in this case do... Uh, church in the round or the arc or the three-quarters square uh, it turns the attention from the people on the stage who are speaking or singing and it helps you turn the attention on each other so I hope that the chairs every Sunday that you show up in April are a visible reminder to you of why we're doing this and what we hope the intent of the series is which is for all of us to engage together and to listen to one another and uh, to find God's leading together. Today we're going to start with uh, two passages that come to us from the history of the early church. So this is after Jesus. This is from the movement that he founded. Uh, this covers about the first oh, 30 to 40 years of church history after Jesus. That book in your New Testament is called the Acts of the Apostles. And these are two passages that if you were reading through the book of Acts, uh, you would probably blow right by them. These are flyover passages. These are things that if you're not careful, you miss uh, how insightful they are, how illuminating they are, and actually how helpful they are for people like us at this time doing what we're about to do. So this comes in the late 50s A.D. The Apostle Paul, who is kind of the major figure in the early church, is on his second extended missionary journey. And he and his entourage, we are told, are traveling through what is now central Turkey. And somehow, God communicated to them through his Holy Spirit that they were forbidden to speak God's message, the gospel, the word of God in Asia Minor or Turkey. That's very peculiar because that's what Paul was supposed to be doing. His entire point, his entire goal, his entire purpose as a person was to be a messenger of Jesus, was to spend his life and his hours and his weeks speaking the gospel. And look, such a peculiar thing to be said that God the Holy Spirit speaking forbid him to spread the gospel. And as they were beginning to go through, these regions are in more western Turkey, the Spirit of Jesus continued to, in this case, not even let them go there. Something, they got the vibe, they got the message somehow that they were not supposed to go to these new regions and spread spread the message of the gospel. Let's backtrack a few chapters. This too has to do with the Apostle Paul. This is before he becomes the key figure in the spread of Christianity in the known world. Uh, this would happen sometime around 40, 45, maybe as late as 50 AD. Paul is just, he's like you. He's a convert to Christianity and he is working as a teacher, called a prophet here, in a church in what today would be the Middle East, uh, modern Syria, in fact. And so there, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets, 
One of them was named Barnabas, and one of them was named Paul. And while that little church, and I do mean little, they were probably no bigger than us, maybe a little larger. They didn't meet in a rented gymnasium. They probably met in somebody's house or outdoors. When they were gathered together and they were doing exactly what you and I are doing, they were worshiping the Lord, and in their case, they were fasting. So they were abstaining from, fruit, from food and drink. They were taking away a common human bodily need so that they could focus spiritually together. When they were doing that in that very common setting, like we do every Sunday, the Holy Spirit said to them, I want you to set apart for me Barnabas and Paul. So right in the middle of church, God spoke. God's Spirit communicated his message about these two people who were in their midst, who were people just like you, who were ministering and serving in these cases of Barnabas and Paul. They were teaching. They were communicating God's message within this local church, and God had something much larger in mind. And so the church continued to worship and pray and fast together and consider what they thought God's Spirit was saying to them, and sure enough, they said yes. And they commissioned Barnabas and Paul to spread Christianity over the entire, what would become the entire Eastern Roman Empire. Now, those two passages have one thing in common. And that is a uh, very core belief of the Christian faith, which is that God communicates to us in a very personal, intimate way, a relational way, and he does, throw, does so through the person of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit with us. And this, by the way, is one of the things that uh, our critics or critics of religion in general mock the most. They would say, oh, really? God spoke to you. What did he sound like? Was his voice a deep bass or a high soprano? Did he have an accent? One would think he would. What did he sound like? Critics of religion find this kind of claim ridiculous. And in the end, what they say you're really listening to is just yourself, your own baggage, your own conscience, etc. And yet, this very basic Christian claim also addresses what within each of us is a very fundamental human longing. We don't just want to believe in God. We want to believe in a God that communicates. And we don't just want to believe in a God that communicates in some book, the Bible in our case, written thousands of years ago that we can read on a page. No, we want to believe in a God that can communicate like that, that we saw in Acts 13 and Acts 16. We want to believe in a God who, when he knows it's important or when we seek his counsel, will speak to us personally. And lots of people who are not Christians, have that same longing. They want to believe in a God that does this too. And so today we want to talk about how the Spirit of God communicates. Of course, for all of us as Christians, for all of us as human beings, I hope you find this extremely helpful because one of the things you want in your life is to hear from God. seems like it would be wise to spend a Sunday talking about how you will or how you could what it looks like when God's Spirit shows up. Uh, But see, this is also why it's the first message in this series in April for us as a church family. We want to turn our attention to those things that are most important in our church's life. We want to ask for God's guidance about them. We want Him to make His way clear for us. Therefore, the place we have to start is, hmm, let's spend a Sunday together considering what it looks like when God speaks. What does it look like when his spirit speaks? What should we expect in this month that we spend together? Hopefully we'll find that. You will find every week of this series that there will be this here in the middle uh, between all of our chairs. One of the most common and historic uh, Christian symbols of the Holy Spirit is a flame because of the events of the day of Pentecost. So every time you happen, your eye happens to catch that candle lit over the four uh, Sundays that we spend together on this series, I want you to remember 
that's a symbol for God's Spirit being here among us. Even now as I speak, even as you listen, God is present. God's Spirit is present with us, and He will speak to us. And that will help us remember. So let's uh, talk about four basic principles from these two passages in Acts that would be very easy to miss if we were just reading through the book about how God's Spirit speaks to us, how He will speak to us as a church family in the next month, how He speaks to us in our own individual lives too. Let's start with the later passage, the first one that we read. And this is about the Spirit uh, communicating to Paul that he couldn't speak God's message for whatever reason, and he couldn't go into a certain region in modern Turkey for a certain reason. What do you observe there? Well, here's one of the most basic principles you need to put in place as someone who wants God's Spirit to communicate with you. Um, We make very well-intentioned plans as human beings. God has no compunction about changing them about entering the scene and surprising us by changing those plans that we craft. There are several Proverbs in your Old Testament that read the same way. Here's the one that I know by heart. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. The human mind, or the human heart, makes its plans. But God guides our steps. The point here is, You and I, as human beings, do our level best to live wisely, to make plans for our families, for our careers, for our off time and our hobbies, for our money. Think of all the things in your life that require a plan of some time. Now, the more spontaneous people in the crowd are going to be like, there is nothing in my life that I plan. I fly by the seat of my pants all the time. Okay. But even for you, I'll bet that there are parts of your life that you would admit you plan. Spending time with family. Making sure you have enough fun in your life. I bet you uh, work pretty hard at planning that out. Where you think you'll be in five years or ten years. How you want to change careers. All of these things are things that we plan. Churches are no different. We make plans. We try to be good stewards or managers of the assets that God has given us, not just our money, but our people and their talents and their skills. The place we call home and on down the line. Um, Yeah, and what you need to know is that on occasion, God shows up and changes all that. He surprises you. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong for you to make plans. You just need to hold the reins loosely enough that he can surprise you and ask you to change them. And herein is the problem. Because when most of us make a plan, we grip it pretty tight. We feel ownership of it. We put some blood, sweat, and tears into it. We care about it. Because we have crafted it and we've discussed it with the right people. And there is our plan. And who is God to show up and throw a hand grenade in the middle of our well-crafted plan? Everybody has a resistance to change. Some of us have a fairly low resistance to change, and we're willing to do it fairly quickly. Some of us have a very strong resistance to, resistant to, cha- resistance to change, like changing the chairs. Some people can, f- can do okay with that. Some people are really not okay with that. It's okay. You have to be able to admit that because then you're setting yourself up for what you know the Spirit can do and will do on occasion, which is to surprise you. So, speaking of our church, uh, here's part of what I know. I know that in the next month, I've seen this true as the steering team has discussed together what we're going to do this month over the last few months. Um, We we have made plans as a church. We have some things in place as a church. All of these are very well-intentioned, and these have been put in place for good reason. And I assure you that God is going to surprise us somehow. Maybe some of the ideas that come out will, will be things we've never thought about before. And we need to hold the reins loosely, relax our grip, 
and shift. Maybe we'll let some things go, and God is saying, yep, nope, it's time to let that go. And it'll be hard because we care about those things, but you have to let God surprise you. This is how it works in your life. God is the one who guides your steps. He is always present. We make our plans, and then we let him adjust accordingly. You are not the captain of your own ship. We just like to believe that we are. This is the first thing you need to know about trying to live a life as someone sensitive to the Spirit's communication. Now here's the second thing you pick up in that first passage, Acts chapter 16. In this particular case, in this passage, uh, the change that God made or the surprise that God dropped on Paul and his entourage, from a certain point of view, it makes perfect sense. It fits with who Paul was, and yet it's also distinct from who Paul was. Now, you have to understand the backstory and where this, this passage is headed in Acts 16 to get that. So I've told you already, the Apostle Paul is somebody who was commissioned by God to more than anybody else within the first generation of Christians, spread Christianity all over the Eastern Roman Empire. Just a powerhouse of a minister, uh, an extraordinary Christian person. So he does that. You saw the passage in Acts 13 that we'll get to in a minute where he's commissioned by the church in Antioch to do this ministry. And so his first missionary journey is to Turkey, and he goes all over modern-day Turkey and he spreads the message of Christianity. So for his second missionary journey, he goes back there. He thinks, well, we'll just do more of the same. We'll continue to saturate the, uh, the country of Asia Minor with the message of the gospel. And God surprised him and said no in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. And Paul probably didn't know why. Frankly, he was probably quite befuddled by it. Wait a minute. I thought this is what you wanted me to, me to be doing for you, God, and yet... You're telling me I shouldn't do this anymore here. I don't get it. Well, guess what happens next? He ends up in far western Turkey in a port city, the town of Troas. And there he's stuck. Like, it literally reads, you can read the story in Acts 16, he's like stuck. He doesn't know what to do. He's like, well, I've gotten to the end of the continent, now there's ocean. Where do I go next? I don't know. And God's Spirit shows up to him in a dream and says, I want you to go to Greece. And so for Paul's second missionary journey, he hops over to Macedonia and Greece, and Christianity begins to be spread in an entirely new region. No one had ever been a Christian there before until God said, stop in Turkey and say yes to going to Greece for me instead. So see, this surprise or this change that God brought to Paul fits very squarely with who he was. It makes sense. He was somebody who was supposed to be spreading Christianity. The change was where he's going to do it. This is going to be how it is for you, too, in your life. Most of the time, when God shows up and gives you direction or guidance about something, it is not going to be an abrupt change from your past. Unless we're dealing with a sin issue or a moral issue, and then it will be. Most of the time, when God shows up and communicates something to you, it's going to fit with your past. But it's going to send you off in a new direction that is distinct from it, like Paul in that case. So maybe this new career shift for you that you're considering, what you need to do is instead of seeing the discontinuity, see the continuity between the two. Maybe you're going to leave one field for another, but you can see that the new field that you're heading into fits very snugly with the person that God has made you become up to this very point. Your story matters. Your journey matters. God has been guiding the steps of your life journey every day, every week, every year. Sometimes he's done it because you've been willing. Sometimes he's had to do it with you not knowing because you haven't been paying attention. But he has guided you to this point. And whatever he tells you to do today is going to connect with that journey that you've been on up to now. It may not sound like it, but that little insight, for my money, is one of the things that you need to carry with you the rest of your life because it will prove the most valuable to you. It will help you make sense 
of where you are in your spiritual journey and what God might be calling you to do next. It always fits together as one big story, just like it did for Paul. This will also be true for our church. Whatever it is that we adjust, whatever it is that we change, whatever we add, whatever we subtract as a result of the next few months discussing and praying together, it is going to fit with the church that God has led us to be to this point. It is not going to be radical disjunction, because that's not how God works, just like you saw in Acts chapter 16. God has had us on a journey to this point through lots of twists and turns, lots of ups and downs. He has been the one to guide our steps. And now we know that whatever is next is going to fit with the journey that has come before. Make sense? Let's put our attention for a minute on Acts chapter 13. So this is where Paul is commissioned by his church in Syria to become this spiritual superstar and take Christianity to the Roman Empire. This happens a few years before the events of Acts chapter 16. In this passage, there are a couple other things to pick up on about listening to God's Spirit or hearing God speak that will prove invaluable for you going forward as someone who wants to have a relationship with God, but for us as a church family, as we seek to have God speak to us over the next month or so. The first thing you notice in this passage is that God's Spirit showed up to speak because they were doing the necessary work to listen. They were doing the work necessary to open their spiritual ears to God speaking. In this case, what that meant is they're a church that's not just an individual. So as a church, they're gathered together as is their custom, and they are worshiping together. And they even took the extra step of doing some fasting together, abstaining from something very common in their lives so they could be more spiritually focused together. And the expectancy for them was when we purposefully, deliberately, intentionally take the steps of worshiping together and fasting together, we kind of expect God to show up and speak. We're not real sure what he's going to say. I don't know that they anticipated that Barnabas and Paul were going to get an airfare to Cyprus to go be God's missionaries. I don't know. But they did expect God to show up and speak. And then when God did say, set aside for me Paul and Barnabas to go do my work, they were intentional again about figuring out whether or not they heard God right. They prayed and they fasted more together as a church family to make sure they were correct in what God said. They were willing to do the work to hear from God. This is one of the common misnomers about cultivating a relationship with God that is very intimate, very personal, listening to God's Spirit in your life. Sometimes God has something to say to you and He is not going to let you get in the way. Sometimes, whatever it is, could be important enough you could be in enough danger. You could have gone far enough astray that God is not going to take or let your plugged ears stop him from speaking. That's true. There are stories like that in the scriptures. But if you want God to guide you, if you want God to give you counsel uh, on a more regular basis, on a more, in a more ordinary way throughout your weeks and your days, you have to do a little work to prepare yourself to hear from him. If you're not willing, for instance, to periodically um, subtract the noise and the movement out of your life, and just be still and quiet, and pray simple prayers, and then listen to how God guides your thoughts and your heart or brings a new passion to your soul if you're not willing to do that i don't know that you're going to hear god nearly as often as you want to or as often as he wants you to if you're not willing to cultivate a prayer life where you are intentional about praying not just for the needs of your family or yourself or your neighbors but praying about the things that god cares about like expressed in the lord's prayer his kingdom coming 
forgiving other people the way that we want to be forgiven. Knowing that we are easily tempted, easily the prey of evil, and so we need his help to avoid both. If you're not willing to pray about things like that, then I don't know that you're going to hear God speak to you about things like that. You see my point? How much work are you willing to put in to open your heart and your spiritual ears to God speaking? We as a church family are going to do some of that. I told you before this month that we need you to fully participate. We need you to be invested. If you are invested then God will begin to move you and speak to you and you can share that with us. Those of you who choose to be detached or not be invested, I don't know how much you're going to get from this. Or better said, I don't know how much you're going to feel God's Spirit speaking to you or resonating within you about what other people have to say. It takes work. This is why most people want to be spiritual and why most people aren't. You get that? There is a real difference between those two things. I want to be a good Christian. How often am I? I want to be a spiritual person. How often am I? I want to have a relationship with God. What does my actual relationship with God look like? It takes work. There is no way for you to hear from God the way that human beings like you and I want to hear from Him unless you're willing to do something. To open your ears, your ears, to hear from him. Are you willing? It matters. It matters for you, and right now in our church's life, it matters for us. Here's the other big picture principle that you pick up from Acts 13 about listening to the presence of God's Spirit in your life. God's Spirit all over the Scriptures, not just in this passage, Um, what he's going to do is bring you to a place of choice. Now, in the case of Acts 13, this choice was both for the church and for Paul and Barnabas. I would have liked to have been there, okay? Right? So I told you, it's not a setting much bigger than this. There aren't that many, more than that many, uh, more people than us here this morning or on a normal Sunday for us. I would have liked to have been there to see how this played out. So here they are. Everybody knows everybody, right? Just like here, you kind of know the people who are a part of our church family, and they're worshiping together, and the Scripture is being read, and it's being taught, and they've fasted together as a shared spiritual discipline. And then somebody, right? I mean, nobody likes to do this in church. Somebody raises their hand and goes, "Uh, I kind of think God is speaking to me about something. And... Whoever it is that was leading worship at the time goes, great, okay, stand up and share. And their knees, just like you, their knees are shaking and they're sweaty and they're like, I cannot believe I'm doing this. And their wife is tugging at their shirt to sit down, <laughs> right? And so the person who raised his hand and felt God's Spirit say something goes, you know, um, Paul and Barnabas have been such powerful ministers among us. They have done such great work in teaching and sharing God's message with so many people and God has used them in such a powerful way here in the in the region of Antioch man I kind of get the sense that we as a church need to come together pool a little money and pray over these two individuals and send them out we need to send them to first Cyprus and then Turkey and then eventually Greece and eventually Rome and some people think even Spain We need to send these guys out and turn them loose as a church family. And of course, imagine if you're Paul and Barnabas. You're like, oh, I didn't sign up for that. You know, I've been in Grand Rapids my whole life. I'm not leaving. Imagine. Or maybe God was speaking to them too. And they go, you know, I probably would have never said that on my own. But yeah, that's right. This is what God wants for me, too. God brought everybody there. The church, Paul, Barnabas, brought them to a place of choice. And he said, look, this is how my spirit's leading. It's very clear to everybody here. What are you going to do? They could have all, like, ruined the spread of Christianity. Christianity would have been a minor religion confined to the Middle East. Lebanon and Israel and Jordan and Syria in modern terms. 
if this one day on this one Sunday in some small church in Antioch, either the church at large or Paul and Barnabas said, yeah, no. I'm happy with what I am. I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with what I do. No. I'm not going to say yes. And what you and I know to be the wildfire spread of Christianity over the Roman Empire never happens. This is what you can expect in your life. God is going to bring you to a place of choice when he communicates to you. I don't know about what. It could be about an attitude change, a priority change. could be about bigger shifts than that for you. But you should expect that he's going to bring you to a crossroads at which you get to say yes or you get to say no, or not yet, or I'm scared, and you stop. What will you do? We as a church will face the same thing over the next month or so as we work together. We will face together choices to make. What will we do when God speaks? What will we do about this mission that our church has, that we all love, and know to be crystal clear, as the most important things that any Christian could do based on the words of Jesus. What are we going to do? What do you choose? God's Spirit wants to affirm to you that he loves you. God's Spirit wants to affirm to you that you are a child of God. These are things that the New Testament says uh, explicitly God's Spirit will say to all of us. Here's the other thing he's going to do for you. He wants to keep pushing you forward. He wants to keep molding and transforming you, and the only way he can do that is to bring you to places of choice. At which you get the great spiritual opportunity to say yes, and it will change your life. The more times you are able to say yes to the Spirit's prompting or the Spirit's message to you, the more you will continue to grow and to expand, the more you chart the kind of spiritual future for yourself that you long for. But you have to say yes. I want to finish today with um, just a couple of uh, great quotes from two 20th century Christian leaders about the presence of God's Spirit in Christianity and how vital it is and distinct it is about what we believe, about God and who He is and how He communicates. And I want you to see in these two quotes that this is what we as a church family hope that He will communicate to us and for us going forward as well. First, this is a great American Christian author named Philip Yancey writing about the uh, distinct belief Christianity has about God's Spirit. Quote, No other religion makes such an extravagant claim that the God of the universe is not just an external power who we must obey but is one who lives inside of us, transforming us from the inside out and opening up a channel of direct correspondence with God himself. Yeah, that's what you and I believe as Christian people. We just want to experience that. And as a church, we want to experience that in the next month or so together. And this is a leader in the... uh, Anglican church in England named John Taylor from the 20th century reflecting upon how he has seen the Holy Spirit communicate to him and to the churches with which he has been involved. He he writes, quote, my own attempts to understand the Holy Spirit has convinced me that he is active in precisely those experiences that sometimes we think are very common. Like, in the case of Acts 13, a normal Sunday worship service, like any other. He is active in experiences that we think are very common. Experiences of recognition, sudden insight, an influx of awareness when you wake up and become alive to something real and spiritual. Those are the earmarks of the Spirit speaking to you in your life. Will you listen when he does? And for us as a church family, I expect that that's how the Spirit will speak to us and to all of us, to every one of us and each one of us 
in those things that we think are very common. From God's word preached to the insight that we have or this awakening to a new passion. This is what you need to listen for as we move together over the next month or so as a church family.